Good morning. My message this morning is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, beginning in verse 24 and reading through verse 29. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, beginning in verse 24 and reading through verse 29. The title of my message today is The Simple Secret of an Unsinkable Life. The Simple Secret of an Unsinkable Life. Tell me a story, Grandpa. How many of you as kids remember climbing up in your dad's lap or maybe your grandfather's lap and begged them to tell you a story that carried you from the dullness of the day to some exciting moment in the past outside the dullness of your day? You know, I've always loved stories. From a very early age, I love to go and sit and listen to older adults share stories of the past, stories from their life that transported me from the limited world in which I lived to a world that I could only dream about seeing and being a part of. Think about your favorite book, favorite movie, that tells a story that you never tire of hearing. Every time you hear it, you just love it more and more. How many of you as kids dreamed of slaying dragons, discovering treasure, rescuing damsels in distress, or waiting for a knight in shining armor to come and rescue you? How many of you would like to skip down the yellow brick road of Oz or fly away to Never Never Land or be asked to the ball by some handsome prince? Yes, stories. They have a way of staying with us, don't they? What makes a story stick with us? Think about that. Why is it that we quickly forget most of the information that goes in our ears, but remembers all of the great stories that enter our imagination? What is it about those stories that stick with us? Well, there are three primary reasons that stories stick with us. The first is because of the people or the personalities that give us a story of interest. We may forget some of the details of a story, but the people and their personalities who tell the story often stick with us forever. Another reason that stories stick with us is because of the life situations which we can easily imagine in the story or with which we can identify with. Think about it. In a story, frequently the uh, plot revolves around some mystery or some struggle that captures and holds our attention. As we follow the characters through the maze of the various plots, the decisions they make, the questions that are raised, make the story memorable for us. A third reason that stories stick with us is because of their timeless lessons, which linger long after the stories are over. Think about Aesop's The Tortoise and the Hare and the lessons it teaches. Think about the implied moral of To Kill a Mockingbird. The lessons that subliminally seep through the stories into our subconscious and have an impact on us that are unforgettable. Well, you know, Jesus was the master storyteller, and his favorite form was the parable, an imaginary story, but with real life application and message. Think about some of the parables our Lord told. Think about the parable of the soils. Think about the parable of the prodigal son and how that story is just uh, stuck in our mind. Jesus told stories, and those stories stick with us. Sermons that stick usually involve a story or two that drive home a certain point. Think about those sermons that you remember. So it should come as no surprise that as Jesus brings the Sermon on the Mount to a close, he would conclude it with a story. Before the COVID-19 crisis arose, we spent many weeks walking through the Sermon on the Mount. Well, today at the end of that sermon, Jesus ends with a story that has a profound punch that impacted the listeners then and impacts us today. You say, well, what kind of impact did his story have? Well, look at the 28th verse of Matthew 7 and listen to the response of the people. It says, when Jesus had finished this sermon, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and 
and not like their scribes. The crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had uh, authority. Look at this parable that had such an impact on the listeners in that day. With his vivid imagery, Jesus tells us a story that burst into our mind's eye like the winds that brush against homes to rain-soaked homes that he highlights in this story. Look at Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. And its collapse was great. Notice several things about this parable. Notice the elements in this parable that are identical. Though we're not given the names of the people in this parable, the parable has two distinct people doing identical activities. Notice this. The two main people were both builders. A closer look at the story reveals that Jesus isn't using houses and rock and sand in a literal way, but in a figurative way. He's talking about building a philosophy of life, establishing values and making decisions that relate to life in general. Like these two people, we too are builders, building a life. The second identical element in this parable is the life situation of each builder. Notice in verse 20, 25 what it says. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. In verse 27 it says, The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the wind blew and pounded that house. Again, the storm here that Jesus is referring to isn't literal but metaphorical. Jesus isn't telling us how to stormproof our homes for a hurricane like Hurricane Fran or Florence or anything like that. He's telling us how we can stormproof our lives. He's giving us a blueprint for building lives that can withstand the calamities that he knows is coming on the horizon in the future. It isn't a matter of if the storms of life are coming, but when, and we must be prepared for them. So there are several elements here that are identical. But notice here also that there are some contrasting factors as well. Although both builders do the same work, although both builders face the identical storm, there's some significant differences between them. Look again at verse 24. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed, and its collapse was great. Notice that the first builder hears and acts upon the words of Jesus. You see that in verse 24. But notice that the second man, though he hears the very same words, does not act upon them. You see that in verse 26. Think about it. If you had looked at these two buildings going up at the same time, you may have thought, you know, those buildings are identical. But the test of the storm revealed the difference. You see, what's really important in life is not what we hear, but rather, it's what we do with what we hear. What's really important in life is not what we hear. It is what we do with what we hear. The second contrast is in the ultimate outcomes of the two homes, the two houses. Notice this in verse 25, that the first builder's house didn't collapse 
even though the storm raged against it. Consequently, this builder is labeled as wise. Notice this. In verse 24, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man, a wise man, who built his house on the rock. However, the second builder's house not only collapsed, but notice in verse 27, the rains fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house and it collapsed. And notice the additional thought there. And its collapse was great. As a result, this builder is labeled as foolish. Foolish. It doesn't take a theologian to realize the rock-like foundation of the wise man's house is Christ himself. That the builder had turned to him in simple faith and trust and actively built his life on the principles that Jesus had revealed in the Sermon on the Mount. The foolish builder, on the other hand, disregarded Christ and constructed his life on the ever-shifting sands of the world's passing wisdom. There's a contrast here that is very clear. Years ago, a severe storm blew across the life of a pastor by the name of Dr. Joseph Parker, a storm that came perilous, perilously close to washing out his life. Listen to these words from his autobiography. Dr. Joseph Parker of London, the noted English preacher, who for many years proclaimed the word of God in the great city temple, tells in his autobiography there was a time when he gave too much attention to the modern theories of his day. Men were reasoning and speculating and undervaluing the word of God, and he found himself, as he read their books and mingled in their meetings, losing his grip intellectually upon the great fundamental doctrine of salvation alone through the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he tells us that there came into his life the most, most, um, the most awful sorrow that he had ever had to bear. His devoted wife, whom he loved so tenderly, was stricken and in a few short hours was snatched away from him. He was unable to share his grief with others. And walking through those empty rooms of his home with a breaking heart, his misery felt for some footing in modern theory, and there was none. And then, he said, addressing a company of his congregational brethren, My brethren, in those hours of darkness... In those hours of my soul's anguish, when filled with doubt and trembling fear, I bethought myself of the old gospel of redemption alone through the blood of Jesus, the gospel that I preached in those earlier days, and I put my foot down on that, and my brethren, I found firm standing. I stand there today, and I shall die resting upon that blessed, glorious truth of salvation alone through the precious blood of Christ. He knew that there was only one sure foundation, and that was his personal relationship and his personal walk with the Lord, and that is what saw him through the storms of life. Notice the principles that we can draw from this parable. Two principles run through this parable like strong structural beams upon the flooding of a house. Think about this. First, if you're only hearing the truth, you're not prepared for life storms. If you're only hearing the truth, you are not prepared for life storms. You can listen to hurricane warnings all day long on the radio and television and on your smartphone, and you can know what to do, but unless you get up off of the couch and do something, you're going to get blown away. Secondly, if your foundation is sure, no storm will cause your life to collapse. If your foundation is sure, no storm will cause your life to collapse. No matter how severe the storm, you can weather it if you've built a firm foundation for your life. No matter whether that storm is a tragic accident that suddenly comes on your life, <laughs> 
no matter if that storm is the death of a loved one, a sudden financial reversal, or an assault by an enemy, you can make it through the storm if you have built upon the rock of Christ. When the rain stops and the sun parts the clouds, you will be there and you will still be standing. So, what can we draw from this? The great sermon that Jesus has preached has been preserved not only for them, but also for us. Has been preserved simply not because it is a literary masterpiece. No, it is preserved here to be acted upon. We are to step into it. We are to make its truths our own. And in doing so, discover the simple secret of an unsinkable life. It is building on the right foundation, the solid rock of Christ, rather than the sinking sands of a self-made life. So my friend, it's time to ask yourself a couple questions, soul-searching questions. The questions are not, am I building, or will the storm someday come? The answer to both of those questions is clear. You're building a life whether you realize it or not. And a storm will hit you whether you're ready for it or not. And so, you need to rephrase the questions. Think about this. Is the foundation you're laying in your life absolutely solid? Is the foundation you are laying for your life absolutely solid? You don't need a degree in engineering to answer that question. You just need to take a good look but not at the self-help books that may sit on your shelf, not seminar notes that may be in a binder somewhere. No, don't look there. Look at your life. A deep look at your life. Look at what you're doing with what you're hearing. What are you doing with God, and what are you doing with God's Word in your daily life? Secondly, is the house you're building eternally reliable? Is the house you're building eternally reliable? Will life storms level it? Can you say with confidence that there is nothing that will make it collapse? Are you laying a foundation that will allow you to ride out any storm, no matter how torrential it may be? It is my prayer that you'll not only lay the right foundation but will also continue to build on it a life that displays the righteousness that Jesus has shared from the principles in the Sermon on the Mount from this carpenter from Galilee that he laid out so clear. My friends, simply put, to know God is to love God. To love God is to obey God. And to obey God is to be blessed by God. Are you ready? It's up to you to act, to start construction today on a life that is worth living, a life that is built on simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the simple truth of your word. Lord, help us to think today about the fact that we're all building. We're building a life. And we're building that foundation for that life either on something solid that's going to stand the storms of life. Are we building that life on a foundation that is unreliable, that will not stand the storms of time? You are our hope, Lord. And it is only as we accept you as our personal Savior. It is only as we live by faith, simple faith, each day, trusting in you, denying ourselves, taking up our cross daily and following you, that we find the kind of life that brings joy and peace and contentment, but also the kind of life that stands the storms of life that we know are coming. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
All other ground is sinking sand. Lord, my prayer is that everyone who hears this message will stand upon the solid rock of a simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen.